But now it's time for Drama on Three, and this week it's The Leopard by Giuseppe di Lampedusa. Set during the years of the Italian unification, Lampedusa's masterpiece is a portrait of the fortunes of one of Sicily's great families, headed by Don Fabrizio, Prince of Salina. The Leopard by Giuseppe de Lampedusa Adapted for radio by Michael Hastings Ora pro nobis, ora, ora pro nobis, peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis, et in ora mortis nostrae, et in ora mortis nostrae, et in ora mortis nostrae. Amen. Amen. I'll, uh, I'll walk now. Yes, yes, Father. Follow me, Father. Well, yes, of course, Don Fabrizio. And hold on to the dog's lead. Oh, dear Lord. Is that a prayer? Oh, oh yes, a uh, prayer for a very large dog. Excellency! Yes, Don Fabrizio is the leopard. He is the center of our lives. We love him and obey him, even fear him but we also observe him. I am Father Pirone. I take confession for the family. There is the leopard's long-suffering wife, the Princess Stella, and their eldest boy, Francesco, and their most melancholic daughter, Concetta. We are here in the Salina Palace, Palermo. It is 1860. Oh, and yes, there is the penniless Prince Tancredi, the leopard's nephew. He is here every day, and Concetta makes eyes for him every day. We are the ones who live most deeply in the shadow of Don Fabrizio. I follow the great man into the garden. It is a garden for the blind. Scents here that are almost cloying. Magnolias and acacia and myrtle, fleshy and slightly putrid in the heat. The pungency of dead lizards. Yes, last week it was just here I came across a dead soldier. Oh, God raise his young soul. He'd been fighting the rebels in the south. He'd been shot. He came here to die. Some say the rebels are coming out of the sea. What can one expect? Who do you fight for? All in the hands of God. We have in Italy four kings, including the Holy Father, the Pope. There is this self-anointed libertarian Garibaldi raising his army. Austria and France might invade, and you shrug God's shoulders at me. Well, you were overexcited by this dead soldier you found. Ah, he didn't die for me. You have great estates, these palaces, seven children, and the respect of all Palermo. Don't you think God must be allowed to work his own changes? Changes? My prince. You said changes? Yeah, perhaps I did. God indeed may have his plans, but I am here in the middle of my own kingdom, and I have to stand up for what I am. These are the palaces and estates of the princes of Salina. Changes, you say? Well, perhaps I meant just a few alterations here and there. No, Father, no. I was trying to confess that the old feudal system is a corpse, but that I have to stay standing. As for me, whatever God's will, I have to inform God, much as I regret it, if we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. My prince. 
Can I? <laughs> may, may I let the dog loose? <laughs> so there the prince sat, watching the great Bendico tear the garden to shreds. Inexplicably, the prince does nothing. He merely sits there. Eventually, Bendico nuzzles up at his master's boots. Good. Good, Bendico. Stay. Stay here. Besides. Grand dining room, may I be forgiven for saying so, could do with a lick of paint. High stone walls, and yet a shabbiness. Exhausted chair silks, tapestry which declares dust from the heat of the day, governesses and music tutors. Servants lay out ornate silver and glassware, everything initialed with the Selina coat of arms. The Princess Stella has ordered a special treat for her husband, Don Fabrizio. A rum jelly shaped like a tower with bastions, garrisoned with red and green cherries and pistachio nuts, quivering walls willing to be plunged by a spoon with astounding ease. Everybody waits by their chairs until the prince arrives. <laughs> Evening, Papa. You may sit when your father is seated. The prince's eldest boy, Francesco, will always rush in with some excuse. But he is the first heir, and somehow he is not always forgiven. I'm late. I'm late. Francesco, for the last time. Well, has he ever not been late? It's almost a family tradition. I insist he's late on every possible occasion from now on. Late because of Tancredi's outside <laughs> on his horse and he has frightening news. Your father, the prince, will say a prayer. Afterwards, the servants have disappeared. Candles on the enormous chandelier wilt and begin to drip soft wax. The daughters of Selina crochet and fetch out boxes of games. Concetta, my love, I kiss your hand. Hello, cousin. Concetta, I embrace you. You say that to all the girls. The moment I arrived, I leapt off the horse. The first thought in my head was to look up at the light in your window and... Nonsense. Oh. Uh, what? Thank Crady, she is not waiting for you to fall off your horse and stumble around in the dark. Uh, <laughs> Uncle, I... I you come with me to the library, if you please. Yes, Uncle. I heard that. You heard nothing, Mama. Your father's all huff and puff. Yes. And Tancredi is too conceited for his own good. When was that a crime in this house, Mama? When I was a boy, Uncle, I watched you sit and study the night sky through this great telescope. <laughs> I was silly enough to imagine you could see the streets of the moon, or even the palaces on Mars. <laughs> Nonsense, of course. Now that we are alone, what is this news you have? Uh, I hesitate to tell you. I'm... Whatever it is, I'm sure it has nothing to do with young Concetta. <laughs> you are right, Uncle. And if it is money you have come for... Well, look, I have it ready for you. Oh, Don Fabrizio, when have you ever let me down? No one could want a truer guardian. And we are not talking about stars in the sky. And Uncle, I... Yes? There is a sense of great arrival in the south. They say Garibaldi has a thousand men at sea. They're going to land at Marsala. After that... After that? I'm leaving tonight. If this is the birth of a united kingdom, I wish to be there. 
Gun in belt, sword in hand, Nuncle. Pirates and ruffians. No, sir. Men who see we cannot go on like this. How many kings have we got? How many nation-states want us broken into a hundred kingdoms, ripe for destruction? And you think you and a bunch of thieves can challenge the authority of the kings? We're not. Garibaldi's a nationalist. He's not trying to invent a republic. Thank Grady. You see, I picture you at night mapping out stars in this telescope. Lights so distant you have no hope of seeing them in detail. Allow me my youth, Nuncle. I ride through the night and I know every detail of the fight to come. You only have one death, you know. Well, at least, Nuncle, you can say you're subsidizing the revolution. Thank Grady. Find your glasses. I will make a toast to the bravest and yet silliest of men who is prepared to die for something I cannot myself believe in, but he wins my respect. To the health of my impetuous nephew, Tancredi! I am proceeding into Palermo. Uh, but uh, it's so late. Father Peroni will be with me. He has some church business to attend. I, I do? Don't tell me you've forgotten your own words. Ah, uh, no, no, of course, yes, I, I clearly remember. Thank you, Father. Perhaps you'd care to see to the carriage? Will you oblige? Oh, yes, yes, of course, yes. I'll, uh, I'll order out the carriage. I cannot believe you want to go into town. There are drunk troopers, thieves. Nonsense, woman. And all the trouble I have gone to tonight. And what was that? You didn't notice? You've got a new servant at the table? In front of your unseeing eyes was the largest rum jelly the kitchen has ever prepared. And you said not a word. Good God, woman, but I ate it. And it was a perfect thing. Perfectly shaped in the form of a Selena palace. Well, what about it? Red cherries and pistachio nuts. Lovely, dearie. And, and God knows what else. Oh, crushed sweet biscuits and dried Egyptian raisins, your favourite. Ah, yes, it was delicious. I absolutely ravished it. <laughs> Will that do, Stella? Why? <laughs> well, it's so late. <laughs> My poor wife. Princess Stella. When we married, she was 16, I was 20. She has never known another man. Well, of course, the commendable virgin. Seven is children I've had with her, and never once have I seen her navel. When I reach her bed, the light must be doused. When I as much as lean toward her with a prospect of pleasure in her body, she lies still and crosses herself. Then she whispers to herself, Mother of God and all saints, I bequeath myself. Now you mustn't torture yourself like this, Prince. The marriage bed. Flames for a year, ashes for thirty years. Oh, no, no. It is God's union. I sleep beside this frail creature filled with fear, but I have needs of my own. I still have my vigor. Your Grace, may I ask where we are going tonight? No. I see. No. I'll tell you a confession at the end of the week. But this means I'm obliged to wander the streets in this carriage. I'm sure you can go to the chapel and find some papers to put in order. And then what? Come back for me in a couple of hours. I am the confessor for all the Selina family, and I cannot condone a sin. But, Father, if you don't know of any sin, what is there to condone? Yes, there is a woman the Prince visits. She's a well-rounded girl, of good intentions. She attends occasionally the sacrament of penance. But her trade is, well... Neighbors attest there is something voluptuous about her, you know, a warm beckoning in her nature. You know, I hear these things, so, yes. God knows I, too, am not without sin. Marianina. Mio principone. The Prince of Selina returns in the early hours. 
His huge body finds the bed in the stumbling dark. For a while he cannot sleep. He remembers Marianina in all her full glory. His mind flickers across the absurd idea of his nephew dreaming of national unity. He realizes he must soon leave the city for his summer palace at Donna Fugata, where it is cooler and there are sweet water fountains in the garden. Perhaps sleep does take him for a short while. Beside him lies the frail body of his exhausted wife, and his body stirs beneath him, and he is restless again in the waking light. <coughs> Oh, oh, Mother of God and all saints, I bequeath myself. Chicho is my name. I'm a retainer of the Prince, Don Fabrizio. The rebel army has landed in the south. They will next lay siege to Palermo. The King of Sicily has no strength. The Bourbon world will decay now. It is all Garibaldi and his men and the romantic idealists who flock to him. Quite sensibly, the Prince brings his family to his summer palace here at Don Fugata. It took three days for horses to drag the carriages along steep and stony ridges. There were pack mules. Trunks and valleys filled with dresses and carpets were piled on top. The gold-painted carriages emblazoned with deep scarlet crests of the Salina family rolled forward, leaving shoals of dust in their wake. Papa, I want to ask you, how are we to behave when Tancredi returns from the south? What do you mean? But, Papa, you can't possibly approve. Better to make a fool of himself than spend all day staring at horse shit. But, Papa... Francesco... He's gone to join these pirates of Garibaldi. There is nothing to fear. Garibaldi may think he can conquer all of Sicily, but he will learn. He will be fed to the Republicans of the North, chopped up and fed. He is a patriot. They'll turn him into a cuckold in no time. Don't bring this subject up again. I am the one here concerned with politics, not you. <laughs> Yes, there were eucalyptus trees in the main street. A sense of occasion. Sheets were being dried out from the tall windows of the Salina Palace. The band somehow struck up a tune. A small crowd gathered. This was the palace the prince loved, with its cool gardens and cleaner air. The dust of Palermo could be shaken out of their bodies. Mind you, even the prince blinked twice when he saw the posters for the rebel patriot Garibaldi. But Don Fugata has become a so-called liberal town. There was our avaricious mayor, Don Calogero, with a tricular sash, now almost as rich as the prince, they say. And the captain of the National Guard and the public notary, all with sashes. My prince! My prince! The whole town welcomes you back! Thank you! Thank you, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Don Galoggio. Well, thank you all. Uh, I invite the mayor and our dignitaries uh, to dinner tonight. My family, my family will be happy to see our friends from Donna Fugata. <laughs> In truth, the prince was unused to this kind of public rejoicing. He sensed change had arrived, and he heard himself actually inviting into his palace those very folk he scorned. It must have stuck in his throat like the devil's pitchfork. That moment began the decline of his prestige. Father Perone, I have to speak. Concetta. Soon Tancredi will get here from the fighting. Nothing I try to do stops this fear and anticipation. And yet, there's a hopelessness inside me. I'm in love with him. But, girl, have you said as much? Oh, I cannot. 
Then has he reciprocated your feelings? Perhaps. I'm never alone with him in the street, of course. But he kisses my hand, always touching my neck. <sighs> he strokes my hair. What am I supposed to think? What is this sense of hopelessness, then? I am timid. I am bashful. I'm almost completely reserved. That's hardly a list of failures. Tancredi is a wild spirit. He cannot keep still. The world waits for him. You know what I'm saying. Have you told the prince? Can you imagine what he'd say? He'd just shout that Tancredi must find himself a rich wife. Whatever dowry he has for us four girls, it will always be a quarter of what is expected from him. Perhaps all the girls are doomed. None of us will marry. How is this affecting you? I go upstairs to my room. I imagine such things. <laughs> I don't know how to explain. I imagine a white dress. I pretend my shoes are small slippers. I found a pure silk veil in a drawer, delicate and never touched. You poor girl. Will God forgive me? Oh, these are dreams. When the maid makes up the bed with the clean sheets, she folds them back. After she has gone, I sit and stare at the absolute whiteness. How old are you? Seventeen. Just by the merest fraction, you sense that the Prince Don Fabrizio is not so much in control. Now the Prince had climbed out of his bath quite naked. When Father Pironi accidentally bustled in, there was the Prince, veiled with soapy steam, glistening and muscled like the Farnese Hercules. Oh, my lord! Here, take this towel. Oh, my lord! I'll do it my top half. You dry my legs. Oh, lord. What is it you want, father? Dare I say it, I am... Um... Yes, yes, dare away. Good grief. It has occurred to me. I'm thinking only for the good of the house of Selina. I mean, Tancredi has thrown his lot in with these unconscionable rebels. And I cannot understand what you expect of him now. Expect? I expect him to be a diplomat. An ambassador in Europe. But if all is lost, my prince... Tell him between my toes. What are you getting at? I am loath to be indiscreet. But I feel I must be emboldened to tell you. That Conchetta is in love with him. And I want you to know she is terrified of telling you herself. Well, it isn't exactly news, Father. Don't you think I've noticed she trembles like a mouse when he walks into a room? It's just the romance of a young girl. Now, where are we down there? I believe your toes are dry, my prince. That evening, Don Fabrizio sat beside the garden fountains. Pines and lusty ilexes. Peach trees now heavy with fruit. He stared at the large fountain. A vigorous, smiling Neptune embraces a willing Amphitrite. Naked under streams of water. The leopard pauses. He remembers. He regrets. Now, Nunco, <laughs> I've caught you out staring at stone lovers at your age. Dang great. <laughs> and still alive. Well, describe what happened. Where's your uniform? What happened at Marsala? Uh, later, later. Then I'll tell you everything. Now, I've put my bags in my room. Where is everyone tonight? Oh, half the damn town is coming for supper. Well, come on, tell me. How men died, how courage defeated some, what type of cannon did you use? What's the matter, Don't Grady? It's strange, this scented garden. And that there's something else in the air as if we're still under threat. I... I love this silence in the garden. How far away the war seems in these trees. Very nice, I'm sure, but... Look at these peaches. How velvet. 
like shameless naked flesh. Well, I've tried to get something out of you about the fighting in the South. The rose pink cheeks like Chinese girls. Nonsense, boy. <laughs> but just now, Uncle, I caught you practically dribbling over the stone lovers. Huh? Now, don't tell me you haven't thought about love in such blue. Yes. Well, you hear that? Let's hope it means the summer is soon over and the rain is finally here. I'm going inside. Little Lepidus. Oh, Sancredi! No one told me you'd arrived. I kiss your hand. No, please don't. Why have a not? Because... Because? You appear so suddenly. I... One minute you're with the soldiers in the south. It's such a shock. Conchetta, it is just a kiss on the hand. No, no, it's not. Well, what then? I... Because it's a promise too much. Come back here. The prince was not dressed that night for an embassy function. So it was something of an unexpected surprise when the mayor, Don Calogero, arrived in absurd black tie and tails. He waddled up the great stairs with all the grace of a dazed penguin. Uh, Papa, Papa, the mayor's coming up the stairs and he's in tails. Your Excellency. Don Calogero, in splendor. <laughs> Uh, now, I must introduce you to my daughter, Angelica. I want you to understand there was a sudden drawing in of breath by the multitude. No one was laughing now at the mayor's bib and tucker. The first shock of her beauty. And these were people who remembered her so well before she left for an education in Florence. She was tall and well made. Her skin looked as if it had the flavour of fresh cream. A childlike mouth, that of strawberries. Under a mass of raven hair, her green eyes gleamed, not without a little cruelty. Tancredi. Tancredi could even feel the vein pulsing in his neck. How lucky we are, signorina, to have gathered such a lovely flower in our home. Oh, you disarm me, my prince. <laughs> Tancredi was sat between Concetta and Angelica, but the most Concetta saw of him was his shoulder turned away. Nothing could stop him in full flood. All right, all right. All right. The night march on Gibil Ross. Yeah. On the night of the 28th, the general needed a lookout post at the top of the convent, where we knocked, banged, cursed, knocked again. No one opened. It was an enclosed convent. Then we fetched a beam from the shell house. And finally, with a hellish din, the door gave way. Inside, we heard desperate screams. A group of nuns had taken refuge crouched around the altar. <laughs> I wonder what they feared at the hands of these dozen excited young men. <laughs> they looked absurd. Old and ugly in their black habits, with starting eyes, ready and prepared for martyrdom. Oh. <laughs> they were whining like bitches, and one of us shouted, Nothing doing, sisters, we've other things to think of, but we'll be back when you have some novices. <laughs> we laughed fit to burst, and we left them there, with their tongues hanging out. We had some Bourbons to shoot at from the terrace above. Concerti, <laughs> what fine lads you must have been. How I wish I'd been there with you. Angelica! Had you been there, Signorina, we'd have had no need to wait for novices. <laughs> Concerti, one tells nasty tales like that to a confessor. Not to young ladies at table. Anyway, not when I'm there. 
signorina. Signore. I... Oh, I don't want the evening to end. Well, what does that mean? Now that I've met you. Well, Tranquedi, we haven't seen each other since we were children. Oh, it means, it means feelings so deep I cannot express them. Oh, no, that's impossible. All in a matter of moments. Eternity in one single exchange of eyes. Oh, please. Have I offended you? No, but... I... Everything in my life passes so swiftly. In a few days, I'll be back down south. Troops will advance to the north of Palermo. I'm alive one moment, I'm dead the next. Tancredi. Then honour me with this. Do you feel a fraction of this same emotion between us? Oh, please, I, I can't. Can't? I... I do want you to live. I... I want no harm to come to you in the fighting. Will that do, Tancredi? <laughs> yes. As for all this impetuous pouring of your heart. <laughs> I kiss your hand. Thank Grady. Oh, uh, Uncle. If you persist in kissing this poor girl's hand like that, as if it is a shirt you're trying to put through the ringer. Oh, thank you, Prince. But I'll survive. The Convent of the Holy Ghost is an enclosed order. Men are strictly forbidden here, with the honourable exception of the Prince of Salina. Once a year, the Salina family visit the convent. The Mother Abbess provides green almond cakes, and the Prince always leaves ten ounces of gold on the parlour table. Every year the same. They know we are arriving. They sit on the other side of the door and will not move. They keep us waiting because this is their little victory over man. Oh. What a wicked assumption. Papa, be patient. The novices might be alarmed seeing other men with us, seeing Tancredi here and Father Perone. Father Perone, God bless you, Father. Father Perone is not thought of as a man. He is a servant of God. <laughs> anyway, he will wait in the outer hall. As a matter of fact, I've been looking up the rules of the convent. It's a little known fact, but one rule says the Prince of Salina may enter together with two gentlemen of his suit, if the Mother Abbess so permits. Tancredi, that's exactly the kind of impenitent intrusion only armed brigands would come up with. Well, explain yourself then. And Uncle, then why can't you get me in there with you? Boy, as you can see, it's difficult enough to get me inside the damn door. Don't speak like that. Well, if you're so keen on it, I suppose I can present your case to... Tancredi, over there on the ground is a large beam of wood. Make a perfect battering ram. I'm sure it'll get you in there even quicker. Well, well, what have I done now? Concerto. No, no, I'm not joking. He's told us he's already blown his way into one convent. That ought to be enough for him. And that ought to be enough for the novices inside this house of women's retreat. Thank you, cousin. And good day. Tancredi! What have I done? The great leopard could see with his own eyes what was happening. But a reserve based on centuries of tradition held him back. Call it fatalism. Call it a deep sense of Sicilian separateness. He could feel the changing hours, a strength being taken away from him. Hello. You will turn off the lamp? Not this time. I'm in bed now. It's necessary you listen to what I have to say. My nerves. Since Tancredi has left, I have had a number of letters from him which I must not ignore. Tancredi? He's been away two months and we're still talking about Tancredi? It means I cannot delay my answer to... What, what answer? Where is your nephew? With his men somewhere outside Naples. How many of you had to deliver an answer to anyone? We must talk. These are letters of great concern to us.
Dearest Nuncle, Trapped here in the austere company of my fellow men, I have tried to repress my feelings. <laughs> When has that rake repressed anything? From begging money from you to flirting outrageously with little Conchetta. Now, beloved Nuncle, in the name of the new order which overwhelms Italy, in the name of my desire to level all classes, I must ask you to express all my human dreams and go to Don Calogero and request for me the Signorina Angelica's hand in marriage. I had so hoped that this would not arise. I'd even held reluctant illusions that he would marry Contretta. And now, the prospect of public humiliation that this Calogero family should in any way be entwined with ours. And as for Tancredi, he is a traitor. Like all liberals of his kind, he betrays his own king of Sicily. Now he betrays us. Oh, that's what happens when one lets nephews into one's home who are not truly of our blood. And as for that slut... Stella, my love, you don't make sense here. You want Tancredi with Concetta, and he's a fine choice. But you also insist if he marries Angelica, he's suddenly the dog of the town. Well, whatever he does, it destroys the Selena name. Nonsense. I admit he's a rascal, but he's also a gentleman. He's ambitious. And he's a perfect sieve with money. Go on, that wretched girl with her big eyes! She is no slut. I always said so. He is a traitor, and she is a slut. I always said so, and no one ever listened to me. And, 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 and how do you know she's not a slut? Has her maid shown you her bed linen? That's enough! I have no more shouting in my own house, in my own bedroom, in my own bed. None of this. You do this, and you won't do that. I decide. And I decided long before it ever crossed your mind. <laughs> My prince. The town hall walls are plastered with portraits of King Victor Emmanuel. The mayor himself, Don Calogero, announces the results of the whole town's plebiscite. It is a vote of confidence in the new regime. Being a priest, I did not vote. Sicily, even Sicily, is being dragged into this new world. What did the mayor say? 515 votes and not a no in sight. And yet I can personally vouch under God there were 40 no's. Is this the new way? Is the rich Don Calogero who buys up church land cheaply and sells it on at great profit the new way? Is it also his new way to discount 40 or so votes which do not happen to agree with him? I can see the prince, Don Fabrizio, on the town hall balcony. He stood beside the mayor. The mayor disports a wide tricolor sash for the new way. I feel strangely cold in the heat of the day. A shivering. Why are you here alone? That's easy, Mama. You look as if you have no thoughts. You think I should be sewing? Be making plans? So much to do when I'm... My poor Concetta. Being alone even gives me hope. For example, when I go to bed at night, I always hope I wake the next day. Don't you, Mama? Hope, my angel, is a very strange bedfellow. And not to be trusted for a moment.
Don Fabrizio chooses a pale lilac frock coat for his important meeting with Angelica's father. He selects a lime juice and glycerin lotion for his hair. As he studies himself in the mirror, he is not without a kind of boyish levity. He sees himself as a sleek leopard, about to tear a timid jackal to pieces. Excellency, have you heard good news from Don Tancredi? No, Don Calogero, no. My nephew's gone mad. What? Mad with love for your daughter, Don Calogero. So he wrote me only this week. I knew it, Excellency. I knew it. <laughs> they were seen to kiss on um, Tuesday the 25th in your garden near the fountain. Laurel hedges aren't always as thick as people think. For a month I've been waiting for your nephew to make some move, and i just been thinking now of coming to ask Your Excellency about his intentions. Don Calogero, let's not change the cards we have on the table. Remember, it was I who called you. I wish to tell you of a letter from my nephew. In it he declares his passion for your daughter, a passion of whose intensity I... <coughs> I was completely ignorant. And at the end of it he charges me to ask you for Signorina Angelica's hand. Now, Don Calagero, it is I who am waiting for you to declare your intentions. May we embrace... Excellency. The mayor stood a full foot shorter than the prince. In a trice, the prince lifted the mayor's short legs clean off the floor, <laughs> dangled him for an instant, Excellency. and dropped him. <laughs> ah, I uh, evoke the protection of God on this marriage. Your joy has become mine. The love between these two children is the basis for their future marriage. As for the boy, you know him. There is endless good in him. Here the prince knew he had now to chew on the toad in his throat. Economic circumstances have gravely shaken the patrimony of my dear nephew. All the Falconeri estates were lost, but during my guardianship I managed to save one last villa. Even that has barely a state room good enough for goats. The tragedy of great houses. Tancredi is no ordinary boy. Far more than elegance and style, he knows about the important things, men, women, the feel and sense of the times. He is ambitious, and he will go far. Yes. And also love, Excellency. Love is the spur to such men. But I am a man of the world. I will put my cards too on the table. I know that Angelica is the blood in my heart. She is the liver in my guts. For her dowry, I will assign my daughter the entire estate of Setasoli. One thousand and ten hectares. Plus the olive groves of the Gibildoci estate. 480 hectares. And on the wedding day, I will hand over 20 linen sacks, each containing 10,000 ounces of gold. Enough to rebuild all the dozens of chapels Calogero has already sacked. The prince had to undergo one last chew of the acrid toad in his mouth. Don Calogero, mayor of Donna Fugata, you are a gentleman and a patriot and an honest benefactor. <laughs> I would not call this the lamb and the lion resting in the evening of days. More perhaps the leopard and the jackal. The Signorina Conchetta has new sheets and bolster cases straight from the linen shop. Thank you. There's... No need to change these. Put them away in the ottoman, will you? Oh. Yes, ma'am. I am Francesco di Paolo Salina, Duke of Quercetta, the eldest son of the prince. I am sixteen. 
There was this day when Angelica made her first visit to our palace as a bride to be. She was dressed in pink and white, and my sisters and mamma gave her a real big welcome, as if she was their new sister already. Even my younger brother Giovanni joined in. Angelica swirled her wide skirts and bobbed to mamma, and proceeded up to papa on the balcony floor. He studied her perfect shoulders and how the wide straw hat let slip her soft silk hair. I mean, I don't go on like this. All words. But she did look great. Uncle, I am so happy. She nestled her lips in Papa's moustache and leaned so close and clinging against him, and he was struck dumb for once in his life. You'd think the Emperor Titus had arrived. Then I clearly heard Conchetta say, Darling, and yet no one else heard. Her voice was lost in the noise. Oh my! What a welcome! Please meet my new best friend. Carlo Cavriaghi. He's a hero of the battle. He's a count with all kinds of chicken farms or pig huts or something like that. <laughs> and I've told him he must stay here with us. Good evening, Prince. Signorinas. We've ridden five hours through the night. But what are these blue uniforms and black collars? Where are the red shirts of Garibaldi? Ah, uh, Garibaldi's men are a rabble. <laughs> good for an ambush, good for a day's looting. We've thrown in our lot with Victor Emmanuel. We're officers in the true Italian army. <laughs> well, find rooms for the lads. Light fires. Raise up the laggards in the kitchen. What a night! <laughs> Dearest Angelica, I've returned. And for you. My darling, I'm head over heels in love. This very moment, I'm wet as a frog and filthy as a dog. Until I'm rested and cleaned up, I cannot consider myself worthy of appearing before the loveliest creature in the world. Meanwhile, I send my respects to your dear parents. I mean, Angelica's house was only across the square. But in Sicily, you do everything by arrangement. You even arrange for surprises. But this is the way of our lives. <laughs> Boys and girls, don't grab the best chairs. <laughs> Spread yourselves around. That money. Sewing baskets and books, if you please. <clears throat> you are deaf to the beating of my heart. You are silent when I am reduced to words. You are cruelly blind to the light in my eyes. Carlo. Dearest Conchetta. Are you happy? Of course not. Nor am I. I could be made so happy if you'd only... No, no, Carlo. Sorry? These poems, wonderful as they are, don't speak to me. I'm so sad, then. The fire is blazing. Look at Bendico here. His fur is so hot you can barely stroke it. Carlo, just reach out and hold my hand for a moment. What does it feel like? Heavens. Quite cold. It's perfectly cold. Yes. Papa! Papa. Tancredi has an announcement. <laughs> <clears throat> Watch carefully. This is no trick of magic. I take out of my pocket a small blue satin box. I press the clasp. Inside is a lining of jade green Chinese silk, concealing a dark sapphire ring cut in an octagon with a cluster of pure diamonds. <sighs> the ring I am giving to Angelica, or rather the one that Uncle here will offer her in my name. <laughs> you may pass it around. 
beautiful. But Tancredi, may I be serious here? You've dragged me from Naples to meet Angelica. Do you know, Prince, according to him, this beauty is the reincarnation of the Queen of Sheba. <laughs> Don't you agree it's time I actually met her? And when do we see her try the ring on? May I? Yes, he rushed up to her and pushed the box in her hand. Then he kissed her full on the lips in front of us all. Oh yes, real kerfuffle and stuff. Hands straying all over the place, he held her that close. And she tried the ring on, which fitted perfectly, of course. <laughs> I saw my younger brother Giovanni turn away as if he could not bear to look. Even I got wind that things were not the same. Have they gone? As far as I know. What does Bendigo say about all this? Has he got a bowl of water down here? It's so hot. Francesco. You're about to take money off me. It's more important than that. What is? It's the most important thing in my life. I'm leaving. Yeah. I'm taking a bag. Where to? I've got the money. Where to, dummy? T take a boat. Naples, and then take a train, then Turin, then across France, then... Yes, then... London. Get a job, work down the mines, haul coal. Giovanni! And maybe get an apprenticeship. You're a kid. Yeah. You'll get lost. Yeah. There's a knife in your neck, somebody steals your shoes. Yeah. You'll be missing us, and crying, and desperate. No! No, you can't stop me! Do you think I don't see what's happening? Concetta and Tancredi up in smoke. And all these wars. No one knows who's king of what. Then this mayor and his money. He gives all this money, but we don't see any of it. And Papa buys a bloody great ring for Tancredi. Our own sister Concetta eats mud there, doesn't she? And do you think there's any money for the other girls to marry with? Think again what's left, brother. I'm never coming back. I am Francesco di Paolo Salina, Duke of Corcetta, the eldest son of the prince. I am sixteen. One day, all this abundance will be mine. <laughs> and where are you two young pigeons going? <laughs> I was just saying to Angelica that there are secret corridors and rooms in the attic floors. No one ever goes there. I told her it's a sort of lost world. Old things left there. Uh, maybe so, yes. There are rooms full of dust. Or perhaps some wonderful furniture thrown away and forgotten. No, dear girl, that's where we send our ghosts and the spirits of ancient retainers and anybody else who has haunted us to death with demands. Like tax collectors. There are a lot of ghosts of exhausted tax collectors up there. Now you make fun of me. No, I'm serious. Up there, dead souls are transferred into mice and pigeons. Not possible. Well, whatever. It's not a place for me. A house in which I know every single room isn't a house worth living in. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Uncle. It was said to be an intricate labyrinth reached by steep, narrow stairs. There was desire here and sexual excitement. Where are we, Tancredi? In a room nobody's seen for years. Oh. <laughs> it's just some old servant disguised as a pigeon. Oh, scared me to death. Hold me. Yes? Prince, you have an important visitor. Very well. The Chevalier de Montezuolo. He is the secretary to the prefecture of all Sicily. All right. Yeah, if I may say so, the Chevalier is here to pay his respects to one of our great princes. He is the direct arm of the clergy to the new government in Turin. He is downstairs in the yard. Well, of course. Bring him up. The 
shore is covered in giant feathers. Ostrich feathers. Well, there were ostriches here. This room is called the Feather Room. One of the Salinas centuries ago had his marriage bed draped with feathers instead of silk. Look, the feathers float in the air. <laughs> They're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're trying to scare me. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dear Chevrolet. Such an honour to be here in this great palace. Well, I must apologise for some things. Although we have Father Perone here to confess all to, oh. <laughs> the Salina family has never had its chapel. The house needs a chapel when a secretary of the prefecture arrives. Nonsense, Prince. Perhaps my ancestors have had a kind of superstition when it comes to chapels close to home. Come over here, by the window. That uh, little Baroque church belongs to an excellent family. Five years ago, the family priest was killed there saying mass. Horror. No one ever knew who did it. Now, look to the far right. Before the hills, the house of the Mutolo family. They had their own chapel and priest. One day, the baron's son was kidnapped by brigands. They must have paid through the teeth for him. They didn't pay a thing. This ancient family did not have a penny to their name. They got the boy back by installments. Whatever do you mean? Bit by bit. First arrived the index finger of his right hand. A week later, his left. And finally, in a basket under a layer of fig leaves, his head. Oh. No amount of family chapels or private confessors or prayer to the Almighty could help the Mutalo family. Oh. <laughs> no, no. Very amusing. Very entertaining, Prince. You should write novels, not tell these tales to frighten an old hand of the church like me. <laughs> oh, indeed. Jocular stuff. Oh, there must be something in here. It wouldn't be locked like this. Dust. Oh, look. Help me lift it up. Oh, it's heavy. <sighs> of course. It's a carillion. Oh, God knows how old. Put it down carefully. It's a music box. Take the handle and slowly see if it will wind. The band in the street played this when all the Selena carriages arrived. And that brought us both together. <laughs> Wind it, son, very gently. While it plays, kiss me again and again. Until it stops. My prince, allow me to come to the point of my mission. Now that Sicily is no longer a conquered land, but is now a free part of a free state... Careful where you tread now, Chevalier. Have I said something which... Of course not, but be patient with me, sir. You almost seem to suggest that Sicily is a vibrant new place. I must tell you, sir, that Sicily has been a colony of some sort for the last 2,000 years. Exactly what I meant. Sleep, my dear Chevalier. Sleep. That is what Sicilians want. And they will always hate anyone who tries to waken them. Even our sensuality is a hankering for oblivion. I'm sure you are exaggerating something. You may even again be pulling my leg. But I have come here with a mission. Of course you have, sir. <sighs> Any right-thinking man would have her now. We're strapped by rules. The whispering, the touching. Desire becomes a torment. Yet restraint itself is a form of strange delight. Alone like this, in empty rooms. So little to say. Our bodies shouting out loud. My mission is to visit the grandest of princes in Sicily on behalf of the Turin government. The government intends to nominate a number of illustrious Sicilians as senators of the kingdom. And, of course, your name was mentioned at once. A name illustrious for its antiquity, 
for the personal prestige of its bearer, and for scientific merit for your various astronomical papers. My mission is to ask for your assent. The last senator I heard about was in Roman times. Didn't Caligula make his horse a senator? <laughs> the Senate is the high chamber of the kingdom. When you have accepted a seat in it, you will make us hear the voice of this, this lovely country which is only now citing the modern world. Be patient with me now. I don't think you understand the Sicilians. We never want to improve for the simple reason that we think ourselves perfect. Our vanity is stronger. Every invasion by outsiders upsets our illusion of achieved perfection. You are not the first, Chevalier, to think you can canalize us into the flow of universal history. Listen to your conscience, Prince, not to some, some blind moral misery in which these people of yours lie. I am sorry, but I cannot lift a finger in politics. <laughs> It's so dark in here. Kiss me. <laughs> you bit my lip. <laughs> I meant it. <laughs> Tancredi. Tancredi. I am your novice. These were the happiest moments in our lives. For Angelica and myself, these... Secret rooms. Lost worlds. Hey, light. In the real world. God, look at your bones. Covered in dust, white as sheets, like cemetery ghosts. And Angelica. Blood on your lips. Palazzo Ponteleone. We, of course, accepted an invitation to a great ball in Palermo. Diego and Margarita Ponteleone were of our own class. The ball is to be one of the most important of the season. Important because of the standing of the family, important because of the splendor of the palace, and important to present Angelica to greater Palermo society. My husband, Don Fabrizio, had recently become very subdued. He had acquired a gloom and an impenetrableness. Something to do, perhaps, with our youngest son, Giovanni, disappearing from our lives. And so the Salina Palace in Palermo, after the excitement of war and so-called unity, reflected this mood of melancholy. Even the dog, Medico, quietened down. You see... It is the influence the prince wields. I sometimes think my husband has lived all our lives for us. Outside a small house, we could see a priest bearing the silver goblet with the blessed sacrament. A young priest behind him held up a small bell. Someone inside was in a death agony. Stop! Right here! And my prince knelt on the cobbles in silent prayer. It was something so out of character. Footman in amaranthine livery, golden ballroom. The orchestra huddled like black sheep in the early crush, defending their instruments. I could see Tancredi in the distance, black and sleek as a viper. Nunco! Dare I say it, surrounded by all your own youthful indiscretions. <laughs> the Duchess of Caravita, the Princess Beatrice, and the Lady Romualda Severini. Slattens. <laughs> I see. Not yet the life and soul of the party, then. The silliness, the awfulness of it here. No, no, my love. There's someone special here you'll be intrigued by. The man who shot Garibaldi is here. Colonel Pallavaccino of the new regular army. I cannot 
thank you enough for getting my daughter into this esteemed society. Oh, nobility in every corner of the eye. Where did you get that suit from? What? Freshly cut from my tailor. And what is that medal on your lapel? It's the cross of the Order of the Crown of Italy. Really? Conferred on me by my municipal elders. I thought it added a touch of... Don Calogero, this isn't a mayor's convention. Take it off immediately. Yeah. Well, if you so advise, my prince. <clears throat> oh, dear. This society business. So exhausting. My husband, Fabrizio, approaches the table of sweetmeats with a look of scorn. But I know his true tastes too well to fool me. The table was a stomach's gorge, stuffed with sorrel babas, Mont Blanc, snowy and covered with whipped cream, and a melody of pink blancmange and cherries shaped exactly like a woman's breast and called virgin cakes. Clearly, they were a profane caricature of our sainted St. Agatha and her cruelly sliced-off breasts. Sadly, my Prince Fabrizio placed himself immediately beside the shameless cakes and ordered two of them and a glass of champagne. I will remind myself to gently reprimand him later. I'm off. Where will you go, my love, with St. Agatha's breasts? Don't start on me. I wish for a quiet moment in the library. Everybody sees, but everybody pretends not to notice as he makes his way to the beautiful carved oak door. After all, he is my leopard. Good evening, Prince. What a surprise. I was looking for some silence. Colonel Pallavicino. I know who you are, sir. I had to get away. Good folk always want to ask me about my great moment. I can only say it so many times of an evening. And what moment is that? You mean you never heard tell of it? My Garibaldi moment? Uh, I tend to keep to myself these days. Of course. A great prince like yourself, but... Uh, you met General Garibaldi. Met him? I shot him in the foot. Well, what a moment. I shot him in the foot. You should have seen him, that poor, great, misguided man. Stretched out under a chestnut tree... A sorely blooded foot. And he said to me in a low voice, he said to me, who had just lamed him for life, he said, thank you, Colonel. And what happened then? I doffed my cap and bent down and kissed his hand. Good heavens. Neither was he my prisoner, nor was he my brother. Just a fellow Italian in search of a unified nation. Just a man like myself, only concerned with the great import of the moment. The historic hour. You must of... excuse me, I'm sitting here eating away. Perhaps you'd care to share with me one of St. Agatha's breasts. Quite delicious, really. Hmm? What did you say? I can become very lonely in a crowded room and without my prince by my side. I concentrate my mind on our children. Yes, Carolina and Katerina are here. No doubt looking to find dance partners for their ladies' cards. But Francesco scorns all this adulation over Tancredi. He won't set foot here. And Giovanni has quietly broken my heart. He writes occasionally. He has become a clerk to a coal merchant in London. When will any of us see him again? As for Contretta, she takes up sewing and stays in her room and deigns to appear at the dinner table. Suddenly, the library door opens, and the famous Colonel Pallavacino stomps out, quite red in the cheeks, as if someone has daubed paste of tomato on his face. I'm curious. And now I have the temerity to seek out my husband in the library. My prince lies flat on an ornate turkey sofa, staring fixedly at a large painting. It is The Death of the Just Man by Groes. The old man, surrounded by his dutiful family of women, lovely revealing dresses, the freshly washed sheets. Fabrizio? Nobody dies like that. In such decorum. 
in death agony, its sheets dirty with spittle, ejections, and medicine stains. You know, I've got half a mind to reinstall the burial system of our ancestors. When we died, they hung us up on hooks set in the shoulders, and we stayed down there in the cellars for eternity. That's how to observe the dying. You mustn't dwell like this, my prince. Shall I get you another champagne? No. Water. Clear, cold water in a pristine glass. My prince is deeply tired. More tired than mere sleep. Something calls to our bodies. After all, I am forty-eight and he is fifty-two. We are old now. Ah, oh, no, Uncle! Ah, oh, lying there. You look so wonderful this evening. Black suits you perfectly. Now, why are you staring at that old picture? You're not paying court to death. Oh, I'm exhausted. Oh, give me a handkerchief, Tim Claddy. Yeah. Have mine. Oh, Prince, we knew you'd be here. We came to have a little rest, but also to ask you something. I hope you won't refuse me. Dear girl. I wanted you to dance the next mazurka with me. I don't know about all that heel banging and banding down on one knee. Oh, do say yes. We all know you used to be a great dancer. But not the mazurka. Grant me the first waltz. <laughs> you see, Tancredi, no nonsense about the leopard. You know, Prince, he didn't want me to ask you. He's jealous. <sighs> of course I'm jealous with such a distinguished man. Agreed. Power. It will be a waltz. How can I possibly raise an objection? You make me feel young again. I know that perfume. Dare you to guess? Bouquet à la Marchal. Mm, how clever you are. Mm. I'm so happy, Prince. Everyone's been so kind, so sweet. Tancredi's an angel. Yes, possibly. <laughs> and you're an angel, too. Highly unlikely. <laughs> Always with you, it's as if you're remembering other things. Really? As if your mind is far off, studying through your telescope. Great matters of the universe and the stars and things. Merely trying to keep my feet. I owe all this to you. For if you hadn't agreed, I don't know what would have happened. Nothing to do with me, girl. All is yourself alone. Wonderful sight, Nuncle. You look like a young blood on his first date. Oh, thank you, mm. Mm. Join us at our table. No, no. Lovers need to be alone, but thank you. Heavenly. Like the old days. Crushed all together in the carriage. And the dew this time of morning makes the seats damp. The girls nodded to sleep. At a crossroads, my prince sat up and glimpsed the sky to the east. The carriage halted for a moment. A long open wagon turned in full view of the prince. It was stacked with bulls killed shortly before at the slaughterhouse. They were already quartered, exhibiting their intimate mechanism with the shamelessness of death. At intervals, thick red drops fell on the paving stones. My prince's eyes were transfixed. I don't want any more of that music outside our front door. What do you care? I care with all my heart. And so should you, Francesco. You're the eldest son, so should you. I don't see why. Papa is in that bedroom, very sick. I insist you do something about that noise outside. Or do I have to do it like I do everything else here?
Bandmaster below. Oil of burning damnation pours down on your tin pot timpani heads if you don't cease. And pronto! Thank you. Twenty-one years have passed since the grand ball of the Pontiliones. Our mother, the Princess Stella, has died. Father Perone is now dust. The great dog Bendico breathed its last. Its corpse was stuffed with straw and put on display in the grand reception. My sisters remain spinsters. Occasionally, Giovanni writes from London. He has disgraced us even further. He's become a diamond dealer. Francesco. As for Tancredi, Prince of Falconeri and his wife Angelica, they live in grand style dwarfed by over-embroidered chairs and cascades of silk curtains. Tancredi is a deputy in the Senate. Angelica has given birth to boys. The world is a new place. I believe Garibaldi has forsaken all politics and lives in retreat. Italy? Oh, yes. Italy is now unified under one king. Uncle is sick. Yes. And you are the eldest son. Only in name, Tancredi. What does that mean? You have all the money. You have Angelica and a family and children. Francesco. And you suggest I have some importance in this family because of my age? You always had everything. Everything given to you. Money for muskets, money for rings, whatever you ask for now. There are no Salinas anymore. Papa is the last true Selina. There are no more leopards. Don't you know that? Explain. 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 I am worthless. How are you boys getting on? Fine. Really well. The doctor is called and I've told Katerina and Carolina to wait in their rooms. Now slow it down. And I've called for the priest. We are rushing. No. It has all the signs. I have to be there. And Angelica. And both our boys. Francesco? Francesco? Yes. Me too. And dare I say it, somebody must go in there and speak for all of us in this family. I know that. Very well. Bearing in mind my position as... No. Uh, excuse me? Francesco will do that. This week had been bad for him. Twice he'd collapsed. He had another fit by the railway station. Before we got him back in the carriage, he kept shouting to us. He had seen a woman in the street. She was wearing a brown travelling dress and suede gloves, and she suddenly became very important to him. He twisted round in our arms, searching and staring out for her in the mingling crowd, wide, desperate eyes searching back. We virtually crept into Papa's bedroom. The large iron bed was moved closer to the window. The smell of incense and camphor drops. Papa had already had strokes, but this time he had a different sensation. He could sense grains of sand in the hourglass, unhurried, unceasing, as they slid lightly away. Tell everyone to leave me in peace. I feel better. I want to sleep. Tancredi and I moved forward. We held his hands, his large, ungainly hands, like the paws of a mysterious animal. It was frightening to be so close to him, and yet never could I be further away. Who is this? Francesco. Ah, yes, Francesco. Where is Tancredi? He's here. The leopard is 73. In my mind, I think he was making up a general balance sheet of his life. He was trying to sort out, out from the ash heap of liabilities, the golden flecks of happy moments. A couple of weeks while courting just before his marriage, 
a few talks with Giovanni when he imagined Giovanni might best take after him. Certain hours in the library absorbed with his telescope in the pursuit of the unreachable. Even, it is said, the half hour just after I was born, when he thought at last he'd got a son who would continue the Selina line. Oh, who holds my hand? Francesco, Papa. Sit me upright for the window. Here. Thank you. Papa. Papa. What are you looking at? Lemon trees in the garden. The fountain sprays water over Neptune. And the girl, she gleams as if she were alive. There are peach trees. Bendigo. Papa? What do you see? What? Out there. The Tyrrhenian Sea. Aquamarine. Where Venus rises. Papa. The Romans were here. Then the gods. All of them left. The priest is beside me. He wishes to sprinkle water. He has bread for you. Papa? Lie back. No. Indulgentia mi comedia me tremisione momnium peccatorum. Ti vi concedi a benedicote in nome del Padre e del Filio e del Spirito Santo. Amen. Amen. Papa, what do you see now? Someone is here. She's walking toward me. A brown traveling dress, a wide straw hat, a veil, little suede gloves so young lovelier than ever before papa can you feel my hand just squeeze my fingers please papa Time is a bit like fine furniture. You have to keep an eye on it. It is now 1910. My beloved husband Tancredi died three years ago. He had a magnificent funeral. Deputies from the Senate lined the cortege. The tricolor covered his coffin. I visit the Selina Palace just like a member of the family. I come and go with flowers and sweetmeat gifts. And Concetta and Carolina and Caterina treat me like a true sister. Each one of us old crows now, each one in her seventies. And I like to think we are always here for each other, always on hand, ready to greet me. Hello? Concetta? Where is everyone? The Signora calls. Why is there no one here? Oh, perhaps because... And why isn't there someone to help me up the stairs? There is only me, ma'am. And where is Concetta? In her room, ma'am. She doesn't accept visitors in her room. 
If you wish, I can help you up to the stateroom. Grief, girl, you're older than me. I'll find her myself. I do admit, Conchetta had never shown me her private rooms before. Yes, nice view. It overlooks the peach trees in the garden. No carpets, just the cold tiles. One money chest, admittedly, studded with hard stones and pretty inlay. But two things which I don't understand. A corner stacked with four enormous wooden cases painted green, each with a solid padlock. And on the floor? An unusual heap of mangy fur. Not quite a rug. Not quite a forgotten cushion. Conchetta. Angelica, what a surprise. Why wasn't I told you were downstairs? A sisterly welcome at the front door goes a long way. But how rude we must seem to you. Never mind that. I do have matters to discuss. By all means. I have been put on the city's committee of honour. We are having a celebration for the veterans of war, which of course includes Tancredi. And we don't seem to have a male representative for the House of Selina. So, I am going to suggest to you that my own son marches in the parade. He'll hold up a placard with Selina in huge letters. Gracious me. Don't you think it a cute idea? A Selina rendering homage to Garibaldi. Cute. And I've thought of you too, darling. You will have an invitation for the grandstand right next to the royal box. I realise Carolina and Caterina won't be too pleased, but I only had one seat left. And anyway, you have more right to it than they have. You were Tancredi's favourite cousin. How good of you to remember. So, so, that's all done and dusted. Talking about dust... You know how fussy I am about fine fabrics. I just couldn't avert my eyes. May I ask, what is that filthy pile of rag by the window? You mean you can't recognise it? No. That is Bendico. Bendico? Bendico. Papa's dog we had stuffed. Unfortunately, over the years, the straw has fallen out. Grief. As you can see, there's not much left of him. What a macabre thing. You remember our great dog? Oh, and how he always protected Tancredi, and even on one occasion saved his life. He found Tancredi unconscious after a fall from a horse, and came running back, barking and jumping at us. I am lost for words. I imagine that's quite a novel experience for you. But what a head I have today. I've almost forgotten to tell you more about the veterans. There is a man, a great old friend of Tancredi, who fought beside Tancredi. Now he is a senator, and he is coming to stay with me at Falconeri. How busy you are. And I know this man well. He even remembers Tancredi talk of you, when they were in the thick of it. Oh, dear. My darling... Tancredi. Now gone. Tancredi talked of me. My dear. Tancredi spoke as much about you as of me. Surely not. He said you were the image of sweet youth in Tancredi's childhood. What an exceptional person is your friend. Yes. Yes, he is a fine man, my senator. May I be very intimate. When I first met him in Vienna, he was in the diplomatic corps with the sash of the tricolour and the king's medal on his chest. Where was Tancredi? He was here in Palermo with the children. So, of course, in Vienna, the senator and I... The senator and you? It began one night at the opera, Don Giovanni. It happened between the first and the second act. I was in love. And for just days, he shared my sheets. Angelica, I'd never have guessed. And your marriage seemed such a happy one. Carriages and servants and family and I don't know what else. I assumed you had won everything. Love in a marriage may be for eternity, but who can deny a passionate woman a few mortal nights? 
I live and learn. What is it? Uh, the signorina has fresh laundered linen for the bed. May I do the sheets now? Leave them on the side. But, signorina... Perhaps later. Yes, ma'am. Where was I? Oh, yes, my senator. He told me more. He told me Tancredi talked of a special night. The night he and I first met. The night of the wonderful dinner with your terrifying father. Tancredi gave a great speech about his troops. How they raided a convent. How they were almost prepared to rape the nuns. So long ago now. I'm sure you can't remember. I will try. Well, Tancredi confessed to my friend, the senator. Yes? He said you were so revolted by the story, it put to an end any feelings you might have for Tancredi. Any hope against hope you and Tancredi would be together. Help me here a little. I don't understand what point you were making. Tancredi confessed the whole story was a fabrication. There were no nuns. There was no convent. It was a lie. And whatever dreams you had were dashed forever. But nothing like that happened. It was all dreams, wasn't it? All that hope against hope was total nonsense. You only had the feelings of a child for Tancredi. Nothing was destroyed forever that night. All nonsense, wasn't it? Yes. Nonsense. Ah, then I must be off. Thank you for the tea, which I never had. I am sorry. You must think me rude. I'm so used to sitting here in the afternoons, quietly, on my own. Good afternoon, Conchetta. Good afternoon, my dear. Hello there, Signora. How long have you been Conchetta's maid? Oh, ever since I can remember, ma'am. You know, I couldn't understand why Conchetta was so strange about changing the sheets just now. Oh, well, the, the Signorina hoards things sometimes for, oh, I don't know how many days. Might be weeks. And another thing? Yes, ma'am. Those huge green boxes with padlocks in the corner. Oh, nobody's allowed to touch them. Them boxes is never opened. Been there for years. I did once pluck up the courage to ask what was in them. What did she say? She said, It's her trousseau. Come in. Ma'am. There is something I want you to do. Yes, ma'am. This stuffed dog. All its straw is fallen away, become so moth-eaten and mangy. Take it out, will you? Throw it in the yard. I had nearly reached the great gate, when high above me a window opened. Somebody tossed down a kind of heaped object. It was the revolting carcass of Bendico. Old hair and glass eyes. For a moment in flight, the dog recomposed itself, its legs dancing with speed, its body flanked at full stretch in a race surely won. The great head lifted up as if leaping the world. In the Leopard by Giuseppe di Lampedusa, adapted for radio by Michael Hastings. The part of Don Fabrizio was played by Stanley Townsend. Princess Stella, Julie Legrand, Concetta, Claire Price, Angelica, Haley Atwell, and Tancredi, Tom Hiddleston. The part of Father Perone was played by James Hayes, Francesco, Tom Vaughan Lawler, Don Calogero, 
Anthony O'Donnell. Ciccio was played by Joseph Alessi, Giovanni Harry McIntyre. Other children were Billy Dudley and Beaver Kang, and Angelica, aged 70, Claire Nielsen. The Leopard was produced by Nicholas Newton and directed by Lucy Bailey. A Promenade production for BBC Radio 3.